Welcome to Brainish English Stories. Once upon a time, there were five pals who finished eating together. They were all grown-up men, rich and smart. Three of them were married, and the other two were single. They liked to meet every month to remember their younger days. After dinner, they would chat until very late at night, enjoying each other's company. These get-togethers were their favorite times. They talked about lots of things, especially what was happening in Paris. Their conversations were mostly about what they had read in the morning newspapers. One of the liveliest friends was Joseph. He was single and loved living life in Paris to the fullest. He wasn't a bad person. He was just happy and a bit unusual. Even though he was almost forty, he still felt young. He knew a lot about many things, but not deeply. He could understand things quickly, but not deeply. He liked sharing funny stories and making jokes, which made people think he was very smart. Joseph always had an interesting story to tell after dinner. He didn't need anyone to ask him. He just started talking. As he sat there smoking, with his elbows on the table and a small drink next to him, he looked comfortable. In between puffs of his cigarette, he said, "Something strange happened to me not long ago." Tell us," they all said excitedly. "Sure thing." You know, I like to wander around Paris a lot, like those folks who love searching for books. I just watch the sights, the people, and everything happening around me. Once in the middle of September, when the weather was nice, I went out one afternoon without any particular destination in mind. Sometimes you feel like visiting a pretty lady, picking one from your imaginary gallery of friends, comparing them, and deciding based on how you feel that day. But when it's sunny and warm, you don't feel like visiting anyone. So it was a sunny day, and I lit a cigar and walked along the outer boulevard with no real purpose. Then I thought I might as well walk up to Montmartre and visit the cemetery. I really like cemeteries. They give me a sense of peace and a bit of sadness, which I sometimes need. And I have some dear friends buried there, friends you can't visit any more. So I go there from time to time. In the Montmartre cemetery, there's someone special buried, someone who was once very important to me. She was a sweet, emotional lady, and her memory brings me both sadness and regret. I go there to remember her. She's done with life. And cemeteries are like huge cities full of people. Just think about all the people buried in this small place, all the generations of Parisians resting there forever. Meanwhile, the living take up so much space and make so much noise; they can be quite silly. Also, cemeteries have monuments that are almost as interesting as those in museums. The tomb of Cavaignac reminded me, though it's not exactly the same, of a masterpiece by Jean Goujon. The statue of Louis de Brie in the underground chapel of the Rouen Cathedral. All modern and realistic art started there, folks. This deceased person, Louis de Brie, looks more real, more terrifying, more like a person in their final moments than all the exaggerated corpses you see in funeral monuments today. But in Montmartre, there are monuments to admire, like Bodin's, which is quite grand, and the ones for Gautier and Merger. The other day, I saw a simple wreath of yellow flowers, probably put there by the last old lady who used to work in the neighborhood. It's a nice little statue by Millet, but it's dirty and neglected. Sing about youth, Merger. So there I was in Montmartre Cemetery, suddenly feeling sad. It's not a painful sadness, but the kind that makes you reflect when you're healthy, thinking this place isn't cheerful, but I'm not ready to be here yet. The feeling of autumn, the damp air smelling of fallen leaves, and the weak, tired sun made the sense of solitude and finality even stronger in this place that reminds us of human mortality. 
I walked slowly among the rows of tombs where neighbors don't visit, sleep, or read newspapers together. I started reading the epitaphs. It's the funniest thing in the world. The funny messages on tombstones made me laugh more than comedy books. Oh, these marble slabs and crosses where families express their sadness, wishes for their loved one's happiness, and hopes of reuniting with them, all nonsense. But what I love most in this cemetery is the older, deserted part with tall trees like yews and cypresses. It belongs to those who died long ago and will soon be used again. The trees there grow from the bodies buried beneath little marble slabs. After wandering around for a while and feeling refreshed, I knew it was time to visit my little friend's grave. My heart felt heavy as I approached her grave. She was so delicate, loving, and fresh, and now, if someone were to open the grave. Leaning over the iron railing, I whispered my sadness to her, even though she couldn't hear me. As I was about to leave, I noticed a woman in black mourning clothes kneeling on the next grave. Her veil was lifted, revealing a pretty face framed by her hair. I stayed there. Surely she must be very sad. She had covered her face with her hands and stood there silently, lost in her grief. It seemed like she was mourning for someone who had died. Suddenly, she started to cry softly, then louder, her whole body shaking with sobs. She wiped her eyes, which were full of tears and looked beautiful despite her sorrow. When she saw me, she seemed embarrassed and hid her face again. Then she cried even harder, burying her face in her hands. Finally, she rested her head on the marble slab, her veil covering the tomb like a sign of mourning. I heard her sigh, and then she collapsed, unconscious. I rushed to her side, gently touched her hands, and blew on her eyelids. Meanwhile, I read the simple words on the tombstone, Here lies Louis Theodore Carell, captain of marine infantry, killed by the enemy at Tonquin. Pray for him. He had died a few months earlier. I was deeply moved and tried my best to help her. Eventually, she regained consciousness. I could see from her first look that she would be thankful. She was, and amid tears, she told me her story bit by bit. She explained how her husband had been killed in Tonquin just a year after their marriage, how they had married for love, and how she didn't have much money because she was an orphan. I comforted her, helped her up, and said, Don't stay here. Come with me. I can't walk, she whispered. I'll help you, I said. Thank you, sir. You're kind. Are you here to mourn someone too? Yes, ma'am. A friend who passed away? Yes, ma'am. Your wife? A friend. You can love a friend as much as you love a spouse. Love doesn't follow rules. Yes, ma'am. We walked together, with her leaning on my arm. I practically carried her along the paths of the cemetery. When we reached the gate, she stumbled. I feel sick, she said. Would you like to go somewhere to rest? Yes, please. I noticed a restaurant where mourners often go after funerals. We went in. I got her a cup of hot tea which seemed to help. A small smile appeared on her face. She started talking about herself. It was sad to always be alone, with no one to share affection or trust with, day and night. It sounded genuine. She looked very young, maybe twenty. I complimented her, and she seemed to appreciate it. As time passed, I suggested taking her home in a carriage. She agreed, and in the cab, we sat close together. When we arrived at her house, she said, I don't think I can go upstairs alone. I live on the fourth floor. You've been so kind. Can you help me to my door? 
I eagerly agreed. We climbed the stairs slowly, and when we reached her door, she said, Please come in for a moment so I can thank you. And, boy, I went in. Her place was modest, maybe even a bit poor, but it was simple and nicely decorated. We sat down together on a small couch, and she talked more about how lonely she felt. She rang for her maid to offer me some wine, but the maid didn't come. I was glad, thinking maybe the maid only worked in the mornings. She took off her hat. She was really pretty, and she looked at me with her clear eyes. Her gaze was intense, and her eyes were so clear that I couldn't resist. I hugged her and kissed her eyelids, which she closed suddenly. She pushed me away, saying, Stop it, stop it. But then I kissed her, and she didn't resist. When our eyes met after this, I saw that she looked calm and resigned, which made me feel better. I paid close attention to her, and after chatting for a while, I asked, Where do you usually eat dinner? At a small restaurant nearby, she said. All by yourself? Yes. Would you dine with me? Where? At a nice restaurant on the boulevard. She hesitated a bit, but I insisted, and she agreed, saying, I'm so lonely, so lonely. Then she added, I need to change into something less dark, and went into her bedroom. When she came back, she was wearing a simple gray dress, looking charming and slender. It seemed like she had outfits for both the cemetery and town. The dinner was great. She had some champagne, which made her cheer up, and we had a good time. I went home with her. This friendship, which started in the cemetery, lasted about three weeks. But I got tired of it, especially of her. I left her, saying I had to go on a trip. She asked me to promise to visit her when I returned. It seemed like she had grown somewhat fond of me. I got busy with other things, and it wasn't until about a month later that I thought much about my little friend from the cemetery. But I didn't forget about her. The memory of her stuck with me like a puzzle, one of those questions that we can't seem to figure out. I don't know why, but one day I thought I might see her again at the Montmartre Cemetery, so I went there. I walked around for a while, but I only saw the usual visitors people who still visit their deceased loved ones. The grave of the captain killed in Tonquin had no one mourning for him, no flowers, no wreaths. But then, in another part of the cemetery, I saw a couple dressed in deep mourning coming towards me, a man and a woman. Oh my! As they got closer, I realized it was her. She saw me, blushed, and as I passed by, she gave me a little signal with her eye, as if to say, don't recognize me, but also seemed to be saying, come see me again, my dear. The man was well-dressed, maybe in his fifties, and he looked like a distinguished gentleman, an officer of the Legion of Honor. He was supporting her just like I had done when we left the cemetery together. I walked away, feeling amazed and wondering what it all meant. What kind of person was she? Was she just a regular girl who went to the cemetery to find men who were sad about losing someone, still thinking about their wife or girlfriend, and longing for lost love? Was she one of a kind? Were there many like her? Was it a job? Did they wander around the cemetery like they do in the streets? Or maybe she just had the clever idea of using love memories from the cemetery for her own benefit. And I wished I knew whose widow she was that day.